Good morning. I, I'm in, I enjoy messy church. I usually skip breakfast, and uh, having a good breakfast to start the day is, is a good thing to do. I'm not recommending my practice of skipping breakfast, but messy church makes sure I have breakfast. It's also good to have breakfast with all of you, uh, to see people, not just the people I'm able to chat with, but to see everybody chatting with each other. The, one of God's purposes for the church is that the body of Christ, the people of God, should be strengthened by the bonds of love between one another. And uh, while we have some fellowship on Sunday morning, sitting in pews is not really, really focused on fellowship. It's, you can have fellowship with the person you brought with you, and uh, sometimes you can annoy the person in front of you, and uh, you can turn around. If you've if you got the flexibility in your neck, you can turn around. But we're a stiff-necked and stubborn people, so it's hard to do that. But it is good to get to know each other. But what we do on Sunday is only a sample of what God calls us to do all week long. Because we are called to love each other, not just Sunday mornings, but you know it, because you're calling people and checking on them. You're having coffee with people. You're getting together and, uh, and helping someone do their shopping. You're doing all kinds of things to express that they're part of the family. They're part of God's family. And we're not only doing that with each other. Last night we had uh, a bunch of people cook a dinner and serve it here. And people from all over the community were here. And we're reaching out with the call of God, the invitation of God, into a community of people who love with a supernatural love. That's what we are. Or that's what we're becoming. Because we haven't arrived yet. We have, we have natural love. Everybody has natural love. Doesn't, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, but it's not enough for this broken world. It never was, never would be enough. Natural love was never going to cut it. We were always intended to have the supernatural love of God, shaping, forming, strengthening, partnering with us. We need Jesus. Always did. There was never a time when people didn't need Jesus. Do you think when Adam was created, he was created so he didn't need God? No. He was created so that he needed God. And more than that, he was created so he needed other people. God said, it wasn't good for Adam to be alone. We were created to be a family, to be a community. And not just any old community, not just... I mean, have you ever been at a family gathering? Not your own, of course, but somebody's family gathering where there was a bit of tension in the room? <laughs> yeah, normal, everyday family sometimes can be glorious and sometimes not. So we're called to something greater. And as he calls us to something greater, Jesus, of course, teaches us. And the teaching that I want to get into today um, is from Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. Now I'm guessing most of you have heard this parable before, but let's take a look at it together. So he says, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. I bet you've had that explained to you many, many times, starting maybe in Sunday school, Sunday mornings, youth group, Bible study classes, conversations, radio preachers, and here I am again, 
You know, the disciples heard it the first time and they did not get it at all. We hear it and we hear it with the experience of the Bible, with the explanation in the Bible. We, the experience of parents and, and pastors and friends that have helped us understand it. But when the disciples heard it the first time, they did not get it. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he, he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is the prophecy of Isaiah fulfilled. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They can hardly hear with their ears. And they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. I'm going to stop there, pause there just a moment. Jesus says something that I, I... A lot of people who've asked me about it find it very kind of harsh. How come the disciples get to understand it, but the other people don't get to understand it? And here's a key to an understanding what Jesus is saying in this explanation of parables. The disciples didn't understand it. Right? They come to him and say, Lord, we don't understand it. So why does he say, blessed are you, when they don't understand it any more than the crowds? What did the disciples have that the crowds didn't? They had the sense to ask Jesus, what does that mean? There are some people in the crowd that are Pharisees, and they're renowned as teachers. And going up to, to another teacher and saying, sorry, I didn't get that, isn't something you do. That would be shameful. Their pride wouldn't allow them to ask. I've seen people walk away from brilliant, brilliant preachers. At least that's what they say. Didn't understand a word you said, but he was brilliant. <laughs> well, uh, have you had a lecturer like that? Like, you know, taking a math class or a philosophy class in college or university? Or, uh, and and, and you, this guy is brilliant, but I don't get a thing he says. Okay, we take it on faith that he's brilliant. He got hired. But what's the point of going to a lecture and not understanding a thing that's said? Is it just to be in the crowd? Just to be part of the event? The point of going to listen to Jesus is to understand. And if you haven't understood, the work's not done. And if you've got too much pride to ask, you're in the camp. But Jesus says, these are people who will be ever hearing but never understanding. These are people who have closed their eyes. Whatever it is that's stopping them from asking, it might be embarrassment. Embarrassment is a form of pride. And it may not seem like the worst form of pride, but if your embarrassment keeps you from getting the help you need, it's going to hurt you. That's not God hurting you, that's your embarrassment hurting you. So some people are stiff-necked, they don't want to listen, they don't want to ask, they don't want to hear. Some people are embarrassed, they're afraid to ask, and some people just don't care enough. Okay, I, I came out, I had lunch, it was nice fish and, and, uh, and bread, with lots to eat. I'm going home now. But Jesus says the disciples are blessed because they asked. They asked Jesus. Mm -hmm. They wanted understanding. Mm -hmm. They wanted to learn. They wanted to know. Now I think, by and large, that represents this group here. 
You didn't come out just for breakfast, because I know you've come out many times when there wasn't any breakfast. You didn't, you, you don't go to church these days because it's good for business. It used to be, and some people would go to church because it helped their business, and they weren't really interested in the message just as long as they shook enough hands and patted enough babies, and that wasn't, church wasn't about knowing Jesus for them. But these days, we're in that group that wants to hear and understand, that wants to come back and find out more, that wants to dig a little deeper and grow more in the likeness of Christ. So then Jesus goes and tells them the parable. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed that was sown on the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the one who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the one who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell in good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. That's a, it's a great parable. Um, we've just spent the last few weeks watching all the farm vehicles trucking up and down the road and out in the fields, um, spreading all the good smelling stuff and, uh, and plowing up the fields and sowing the seed. And we're already at a point where we see the corn just, you know, growing up in our sight. We see the soybeans and the wheat and the hay and all the crops doing fairly well. Some could use a little less rain, some could use a little more rain, but they're growing. The, see, the parable of this sower is something that we can relate to every year. And every time we plant something in the garden, or even start something in our, in our house before, before planting time comes. But he says that the, the seed is the Word of God. And, of course, we think of the Word of God in many ways. The Word of God is the Bible. So somebody hears something from the Bible. But the Word of God isn't only the Bible. Of course, Jesus wasn't yet published. Jesus' words are the Word of God, but they weren't yet written down. And the Word of God often comes to us in other ways, when you're hearing a sermon, when someone is telling about what God has done in your life, when someone is explaining this, the, the way of salvation. But for the purposes of, of, of today, we, we need to understand that the Word of God is the Word of salvation. We can argue all day about uh, genealogies. We can argue all day about how, what exactly happened in the creation story. We can argue with, with people about what the word means when it says the sun rose and the sun set. We can argue about all kinds of details and so on, but but really the question is, when the word was given, did you understand what God was saying to you? And I'm going to summarize, and summar summaries are always dangerous, but in summary, the word of God that Jesus is talking about is the invitation to have life in him. The invitation to have life in him. That's as simple as it gets. He says to people, come follow me. And following him, they'll learn all the stuff that they need to know about how to live and about at what cost they were saved. And they'll learn more and more about what in their life is, is following the path of God and what in their life is not following that path. The invitation, follow me, is probably the shortest form of Jesus' call to salvation. That's an easy thing to understand. Except when somebody comes up to Jesus and says, um, 
I'll follow you, but later. I've got some things to do at home, and then I'll come and follow you. And Jesus says, you don't understand. I called you to follow now. Or somebody says, I'll follow you. What do I need to do? And Jesus says, well, sell all your riches and give them to the poor. And the guy says, I didn't really mean follow you so much. <laughs> or when Jesus says, forgive the person who's harmed you. And I didn't know that was part of the bargain. Anybody had trouble with that one? If you haven't had trouble with that one, it's probably because you've been ignoring it. Because it's hard. But the follow includes all of that, right? It includes the whole thing. Now when he says to, to people, come follow me, some of them don't understand it. They say, well, I'm already following the Ten Commandments. I'm already doing all the laws of the Pharisees. And I'm, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape. You find other people who say, I don't have anything to do with religion. But I'm a pretty good person, so I think I'm kind of following him. You find all kinds of people who don't get the simplest invitation. Follow me. So the disciples did something very important when they said, Jesus, we're not, we don't get it. They let Jesus explain to them about it. Now, all of us have times when seed goes out and it falls on the path, right? We, we understand that picture of you hear something, you don't get it, and you can't remember it five minutes later. Right? The, the birds come and take it away. It's not always you know, a spiritual thing. The, that, that formula that you learned in math class that you somehow suspected you'd never actually need in life, and it, you didn't understand it, you didn't ask, you didn't do the homework, you just said, I don't need that and you don't even remember what it was anymore. Things get stolen away from our minds all the time because they don't sink in. Am I right? I have this unfortunate, every joke I ever hear sinks in. <laughs> I sure wish the Word of God would sink in that deep and that permanently, wouldn't you? Do you have, do you have lyrics from, uh, from Jingles from, from advertisements from 1972 in your mind. And some of you weren't even alive in 1972, and you still have them. <laughs> there are things that sink in and things that don't. But sometimes it takes work for the Word of God to sink in. And it's very important that it does sink in. Now, one thing about this parable that I kind of, in my mind, I was thinking... You know, one quarter of the seed falls on the path, and one quarter of the seed falls on the rock, and one quarter of the seed falls on the, uh, on, among the weeds, and one quarter is, falls on good soil. Is that how it works in farming? No. If you, if you, if you spread your seed like, seed like that, you'd, you'd be doing a bad job of farming, wouldn't you? The fact is, this is a very optimistic parable even though it speaks of various hazards. Because look at the fields. 99% of the seed, well, okay, you tell me what percentage of the seed grows up. Pretty close. Most of the seed goes into good soil. But where there are hazards, Jesus is saying, pay attention. So one hazard is you don't get it. And we've already covered how the disciples repaired that. They ask for understanding. Now, I will grant that sometimes you ask for understanding and the explanation doesn't help you much. I'm afraid that's a place where sometimes you have to go on trust until you understand some other things enough to understand what God is telling you to do. So, sometimes we don't know exactly why God has told us what to do, and, but we do it anyways. Right? Sometimes what Jesus tells the people to do goes against their, their learning, it goes against their culture, and it goes against their instinct. Forgive my brother 70 times 7? That's crazy. You're just, just asking him to be bad. 
That's not how that's not how life works. You really have to turn the screws on him and make him better. And, and Jesus says, "That's the kingdom of God." It goes against my instinct. It goes against my culture. It goes against my training. But I do it because God said that's how it works. And as I've been doing it, and probably many of you can say the same, as you've been doing it over the years, you come to realize it's the only way to live. It really is. God's way, it really is the only way to live. Everything else leads to death and destruction. And so we follow, sometimes when we don't understand, until we do understand. Then there's a seed that falls, falls among the rock. And Jesus... I, th I think you've seen this, you know, you, you, you have some rocky soil and stuff just won't thrive. It, it grows up and then a couple of hot days and it's gone. I've got a stretch in my lawn where something was buried years ago and something about the soil there just isn't right. And uh, so while the rest of the lawn is green and lush, the, that part is kind of in. Do you have that in your lawn? you have tips for getting rid of that for me? <laughs> well, Jesus says that we can understand and receive the word of God, but if we don't put down roots, that's the metaphor, putting down roots, deep enough that a few days of drought, a harsh sun, a bit of difficult travel, won't destroy what's been planted there. So how do we put down roots? in the Word of God, in this invitation of Jesus? How do we get that endurance and perseverance? Now, I know that you can amend soil, right? You can take rocky soil and uh, sometimes you have to pick up the rocks. There was one missionary who was uh, working in a, in, a, in a very, very distant place that had never heard of the Gospel before, never been reached by Western civilization for good or for ill. And uh, in his, when he was on furlough and explaining the work he was doing, people would keep asking him, how many souls you've saved? He said, we aren't at that stage yet. You know, uh, um, Paul talked about, you know, Paul plants and Apollos waters, but God brings the growth. He says, we're not at the watering stage. We're not even at the planting stage. We're at the removing rocks stage. Every field around here was once a forest mostly. And the farmers who came had to cut down the trees and pull up some really nasty stumps. And when they'd done that, they'd start plowing and they'd find a rock for every plow blade. You know, there was, it was a lot of work. In some places, of course, you go and you find that the, the fields have these beautiful rock stone fences and you think, isn't that pretty? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that nice? It is nice because now the soil is ready. For some serious growth. The rocks in our lives sometimes have to be removed. Sometimes it's healing prayer to take out a rock that was thrown at you and embedded itself in your soul. Sometimes it's that stubbornness that you're not quite sure where it came from, but it's been there your whole life. And sometimes, you know, rocky soil is always draining. And some people are always drained. They just can't hold on to the life-giving water that pours in from the Spirit of God. And it takes amending the soil. And we can do that not just to a field, but in, in our lives, in each other's lives. There's a wonderful, uh, wonderful tract. It used to be a sermon, but now it's a tract. By Whitney Prattney called Breaking Up the Fallow Ground. Has anybody ran into that before? I ran into it very early in my Christian walk. Uh, and it was just this, this beautiful, beautiful uh, extension of this metaphor. Talking about how to, how to break it up, how to break up the pathway that's been trampled. Right? How, it, it feels simple. You get the, the, it, the, you've got the tools, the machines, you've got the horses and the tractors, or... Uh, maybe they've got like uh, nuclear devices now to do it. I don't know. But you can, 
break up the pathway that somebody had been cutting across your field for years and nothing will grow there and you break it up. You can add different fertilizers and I've got a guy, uh, he was in my barbershop for us in Ottawa. He was working on a, on a thing that, that tested, as they were harvesting, tested the moisture content of everything they harvested so they'd know where they needed to add more irrigation on the field next year. And they'd be able to irrigate just the parts of the field that needed irrigation and not waste water on the places that had lots of water. Mm -hmm. Wow. We don't take as much care of our souls as that. About finding out where the rocky places are and doing something about it. But we can. We've got instructions in the Word of God. We've got the company of saints, some of whom have been through things that you are going through right now. And other people that are going through, through something that you've been through, that you're going to help. We, we, we come here and we get fed at, at breakfast. And many people come Sunday by Sunday to get fed by the sermon. But you are also here to feed others. Right? It's not a one-way distribution here. We have the opportunity to, to amend the soil of each other's hearts. And I really like that when Jesus gets to the thorns, he describes two very distinct problems. He describes the cares of this world. And that we can understand as weeds. The things that make you anxious. The things that go wrong and that drag you down. The things that take up your time when it would be time better spent praying or encouraging or serving the Lord and you're just busy with all this stuff that happens. Cares of the world can drag us down and choke out the life within us. They can try at least. But he also talks about the deceitfulness of wealth as being a, a weed. Deceitfulness of wealth. Can you imagine anyone being choked, their faith being choked out by the deceitfulness of wealth? You usually think of rich people. You've got everything they want, and they can go on vacation here and there, and do this and that, and have all the best of everything, and just be totally satisfied with, with what the world is dishing out to them. And that's certainly a problem. There are people who, who won't realize there's something wrong in their life because they have so many levels of padding in their life. But there are also people who are really wealthy and anxious about it all the time. They've managed to combine the two. Isn't that a, isn't that a thrill? That is, that is really inventive. They have tons of money sh stocked away, but they want to build more warehouses. They want to build, get bigger ba bank accounts. They want more and more insurance against everything going bad. And they manage to be, be deceived by wealth and filled with the anxiety of life. They've got the best of both worlds, don't they? Sometimes we have a little bit of both worlds, too, where we aren't quite sure where to put our energy, where to put our attention, or even how to fix the things that are causing us grief. And I think, again, that's where the, the, the company of the saints, the fellowship of the church is great, because sitting and talking with someone about it and praying with someone about it, and sharing wisdom, sharing the Word of God together, is really good at helping us turn our attention to the, to the truth, to the light, to the glory of God, and see problems in the right perspective. Am I right? God is bigger than any problem that we've got? Amen. Now, I've just re been reminded in the last couple of weeks about uh, Kids in the Hall. Remember Kids in the Hall, the comedy group on CBC? It was a kind of crazy comedy. I remember one guy who would go around, nobody home, nobody home, I can't see you, I can't see you, and then he'd go, I crush, I crush your head. And he'd be looking through his fingers at, at all the heads he could crush. <laughs> and then he couldn't see anybody. Our problems look big. 
when they're this close. And God looks small when he's far away. So we've got to bring God close again. Get our eyes on him. And recognize that our anxiousness and cares really have no, no power to disturb the love that Christ has for us. Didn't Paul say, I assure you that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing in heaven, nothing in hell, nothing in life, nothing in death, nothing present or anything in the future. You notice he didn't mention the past because sin has already been dealt with. So past is past. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. But when the problems are right in front of us, they take our breath away, don't they? They take our sleep away. They take our calm away. And we might need some help from other people. We might need to come to church on Sunday and sing some songs that remind you of how great is our God. You might need to turn them on in your home, too. You might need to turn off some of the news and put on some of the praise. And the deceitfulness of wealth. Poor people can be deceived by wealth. They can think, all my problems would go away if only I were rich. No. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Trying to solve the problem of wealth in order to get everything that you think you need is a distraction from the main part of life. It's to find Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and discover that he provides all the rest according to his goodness and his mercy. God is sowing his seed. He's sowing it today as we, as we listen to his word. He's sowing it through more channels, more opportunities than this world has ever seen. You could not have worship songs playing in your home 24 hours a day, even, even 100 years ago. You'd wear out your records if it was 80 years ago. You'd stretch all your 8-track tapes uh, 50 years ago. But now you can just have Google, not entirely the servant of God, serve you up one worship song after another. You can get the old hymns, you can get the new songs, you can get things that haven't been sung for, for 500 years because they've been forgotten, that somebody's got it on the internet now. You can hear good preaching. You can also hear bad preaching. You can hear the Word of God just read to you if you're not a reader. I think that's just amazing. We've become such a literate culture, we've forgotten that for, for a couple, well, 1,500 years, most Christians didn't have a Bible in their home. And yet they, the word of God spoken on Sunday was what they, what they lived on. And they had to memorize a lot more because they couldn't say, I'll look it up later. But it was in there, when it's memorized, it's in your heart forever. Did you know that Hebrew kids, the boys were taught to read so they could read in the synagogue. By, by the time they were 12, they could read the Torah. But did you don't know they also were supposed to have memorized the Torah by then? Because it wasn't enough to hear it on Saturday. You had to be able to meditate on it as you lay in your bed, as you walk down the, the street, as you, as you talk with another, another Israelite. You needed that word of God all the time. And now we have it available to us. But there's also cat videos. There's also reruns of Hogan's Heroes. There's all kinds of things we can spend our time on. And while God's word is more available to us than it's ever been, we're acting a little bit like that bad soil where we're letting the, the, the weeds grow up, where we're letting the, the, the water drain away and leave us dry and lifeless, where we're letting things bounce off us and instead of pursuing the things of God that have just bounced off the hard soil of our hearts, we say, ah, it's easier just to dive into that black hole of YouTube or, or TikTok or whatever. But God has given us access to his word 
so that the seed can grow up in us. And I've told you this guy before, but when I was a student, I worked at a brewery. Is that okay? It was Sleeman's. It just opened up in Guelph, and my, my best friend was one of the brewers there. And he got me a job in maintenance, so I could, uh, I, I could take care of the gardens and the yard. And I had to clean up places like the barley mill. They had a big you know, silo thing, and at the bottom of it, in the inside, it came to a cone and went into a grinder. And then it went through a tube out to the, uh, to the rest of the uh, plant where they would actually do the brewing. But seeds spilled out of the grinder. And so it lay there on the floor of the, uh, of the, of the, of the silo and just mostly just sat there. And nobody had been in to clean the silo when I arrived for quite some time. And some of the seed had fallen on the concrete by a vent. And water had rushed, rain, splashed in from the rain onto that seed, and it had rock. Because there was no soil. It wasn't even rocky soil, it was just a rock. And then more seeds spilled onto the rotted seed, and you could see that there was the remains of, of plants that had started growing. It had been kind of like the rocky soil, thin soil, but it had gotten a start and they germinated and a little bit of sprout had come out. And then it died and rotted. And over time, a good thickness of soil had built up underneath that vent. And now you could see barley stalks kind of winding up towards the vent and some were even heading out into the light of the sun through that vent. And I thought, a sower goes to sow some seed. Wow. If anybody feels hopeless, that this, they're never going to understand this. Or that they, they've heard it before and it, they got excited and then they got unexcited again. Or they were really doing well but then some things happened and it just doesn't, isn't the same. This is a parable of hope for you. Because a seed that seemed to go nowhere, even if it just fed the birds, and the bird poop enriched the soil, there's still hope. There's still something God has to do in your life. That He will do and can do. If you'll just hear the word one more time, when Jesus says, come with me. Let's pray. Lord, you are good. And we pray that your word would continue to go out into our lives and, and, and make us fruitful. And Lord, go out into our world, which right now is not really looking like good soil. But you know what you're doing. You know how to save even from the uttermost despair and loss. And we pray that we will see your seed sprout up throughout our country, throughout our world, in our generation, to the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.